Good evening, everybody, uh, both uh, everybody who's online, as, as I unfortunately am. I'm really, really sorry that uh, the resolution of the train strike didn't occur in time for me to uh, get myself a reliable train to LSE. Uh, and it's a huge shame for me because this is one of the most important books we've produced at LSE Press. Anyway, let me uh, introduce myself. I'm Pat Dunleavy. I was a professor in the LSE government department for a long time. And, uh, and now I'm Emeritus Professor of uh, Political Science and Public Policy. And wearing my other hat, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the LSE Press, which as you probably know by now is uh, the LSE doing everything that Oxford and Cambridge did 200 and 300 years ago. Uh, one day we'll even get a business school, who knows, you, never, you could never tell. Um, so one of my roles in that, in that job uh, as Editor-in-Chief is to help develop uh, the scholarship of, of uh, young emerging scholars who've got a huge story to tell. And so it was a great, uh, a great blessing for us when we uh, were able to work with Yan Wang and converting her PhD, which she did in the Department of Sociology, into this very impressive book on Chinese pension policy and governmentality in China. And Yan Wang uh, has uh, subsequently to her PhD worked in the Department of Methodology and then moved to the School of Public Policy. And in January, very sadly for LSE, she'll be moving to the University of Lancaster to a career track post in lectureship in digital sociology, for which I can think of very few people who are more qualified than she is. Um, now, her uh, presentation will will commence in a minute I'll say a bit about that but I should say something also about our two panelists who are in the room uh, very sorry not to be with you um, so Carrie Frieser is a associate professor of sociology um, and uh, is a, an expert on science and technology studies and um, situational analysis and uh, medical science and um, well-being and, and related issues and Professor Noel Yuchtman is uh, in the Department of Management. He's an expert in managerial economics and strategy. And he's written on a very large range of subjects, including political economy, economic history, human capital, and very importantly for us, uh, the state and uh, economic development. And his many articles include articles in the American Economic Review, the Quarterly Journal of Economics and the Review of Economic Studies. So we've got very distinguished panelists from sociology and uh, from um, uh, manage management or economics uh, to discuss. And they're going to comment after Jan's talk for about five or six minutes each. So <laughs> we hope it's not too, too short. Um, <laughs> let me just now introduce Jan's topic because it is really one of the most important topics and the least well understood topics I think in London and Washington and all points west which is how does the Chinese state operate it's a really interesting question because um, China has been through some fantastically important and fantastically large-scale changes in the process the government has had to make some very big alterations in policies that make a great deal of difference to people's economic lives and their uh, whole approach to society and the way in which they look on their participation in society. And Yan introduces here the concept of governmentality, which is a concept that comes from really Foucauldian studies of, of the state. Um, and emphasizes that the state operates not just in China, but in any setting anywhere in the world, the state operates in multiple diverse ways through many different institutions. And um, the way in which the state orchestrates and delicately assembles uh, uh, that uh, way of working, that diffused power situation, and in particular, the employment of different kinds of tools, such as ideology, uh, information, manipulation, 
uh, in, induction of new norms and uh, new values. Those are very important ways in which the state um, can uh, make changes. And that's particularly the case in very long run policies that matter a great deal to people of which pensions policy is one of the most important. And so Yan Wang, in her brilliant book, documents how the Chinese state has, on the one hand, moved uh, to create pensions for very large millions and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, and at the same time has had to uh, demobilize previous ways of organizing pensions for industrial workers, particularly the so-called iron rice bowl, and move towards a more of a mixed pension funding system, which is also to some extent a broader system uh, and uh, uh, as a result. So this is a story of considerable complexity and Yang unpicks it with great sophistication. And that's what I'd like her to, uh, to do now. So I'll, I'll just invite her to kick off Yang. Great. Um, thank you, Patrick, for your introduction. And to be fair, you have contained many <laughs> information I want to introduce myself, but I think your way is better in my way uh, compared to my own introductions. Um, but still, uh, I really appreciate your, your uh, kind, uh, kindness in introducing the book, um, especially the context um, and the book lies um, um, the political sociology as well as the uh, China studies. Um, and uh, um, I, um, so as Patrick mentioned, this book uh, was divided from my dissertation. And uh, um, I really appreciate all the efforts done by Elsie Price and also the, uh, my colleague from uh, FPP, the Flan Elsie Center as well as the uh, support from my uh, supervisors, um, Karen Long, um, and uh, many others like Hayden, uh, uh, you see. So um, this book is uh, uh, now open access. Um, is that because I want to share the knowledge I learned um, during my PhD process, um, and also to introduce to uh, the academic and non academic audience uh, more about China. Um, so tonight here, I just wanted to uh, lay out the general context and, and um, uh, provide the uh, puzzle of the book and I'll give a little bit uh, an example, um, um, a substantive example here. So this book um, is about the story of governance in modern society uh, with a focus on the uh, state society in action um, uh, using China's case. Um, the context of the story is that we normally uh, would think that rapid uh, economic growth can be a uh, disruptive um, social process, threatening the uh, uh, social relations and ideologies of the incumbent power. Um, for instance, the uh, modernization theory would argue that a mismatch between uh, social uh, modernization and the institutional modernization um, would uh, produce some uh, social frustrations um, and potential uh, instabilities. China's case, um, uh, for example, the, the, especially after the reform and opening up, um, this process strongly stimulated the economy and the social modernization um, in a time scale that has uh, previously taken Western societies um, centuries to achieve. It gave rise to, uh, to the uh, urban, uh, urbanization uh, process the rising level of uh, um, uh, education um, and the expansion of the uh, literacy. Also, there is an increasing demand of uh, political, political participation. Um, however, the corresponding um, political institution did not um, give this kind of um, adequate uh, channels for uh, the political participation. As shown in the figure, um, the um, rapid development of the uh, economy uh, is in sharp contrast to the uh, relatively um, uh, static nature of its political institutions. 
Um, so um, Burns and Moore um, also have this kind of comparative study um, um, raised some uh, similar concerns drawn from China's urban revolution. Uh, according to him, uh, if uh, um, something happens to uh, threaten the uh, threaten and destroy the daily daily life of uh, um, of most of people, there may be a revolution from the uh, below. Um, however, China's case tells us that. Um, the government could actually uh, lead a major social and economic reform um, over like 40 years uh, without yet encountering um, uh, some fundamental challenges um, subverting its goal. So a key question for political sociologists is that how, uh, how does the uh, uh, logic of the China's uh, uh, government's uh, governmentality being able to help maintain the compliance from, from the public well, um, acting uh, so radically to promote the uh, economic prior priorities. So this book actually explores the question from uh, uh, from some detailed analysis of the uh, trajectories, uh, the uh, policy rationales, and also the effect of uh, China's pension reforms, trying to demonstrate the uh, statecraft that um, shapes the ways uh, the citizens um, perceive the uh, responsibility and and uh, um, um, uh, benefits allocations between themselves, the state, and the other sectors. So the theoretical inquiry of this book is actually built upon, as uh, uh, um, Patrick mentioned uh, a little while before, um, built upon the Guevara and the Gramsci tradition of understanding the uh, state's rule um, and highlights the um, uh, individual's rationale of believing and consent. So um, uh, it also takes account of, um, of the uh, Foucauldian governmentality uh, the state uses to maintain its rule and then investigate the underlying the rationale. The um, analytical paradigm of this uh, uh, um, research actually adopts a, a holistic viewpoint, integrating both consent uh, based uh, um, um, uh, statecraft and the coercion based um, statecraft. So the engine of this uh, interaction between uh, um, this inductive model is not just uh, the objective economic uh, situation, um, as in the uh, conventional Wintrop model, but the general design of the ruler, uh, which is constantly updated according to uh, its understanding of the current situation, uh, uh, the public and its own objectives, and um, or, or simply as uh, the concept called governmentality. So the upper panel displays the various possible statecraft um, the state could use uh, in a continuum of hard and soft approaches. Uh, in the bottom panel, in the scale of uh, uh, outcomes of the statecraft, um, uh, public reaction could vary from sincere uh, believers to uh, forced compliance and to uh, even to uh, collective non-compliance, uh, which could be dangerous for the state. Um, so both of the typologies uh, do not exhaust all the possibilities, but act as a, a guidance for us to to um, see uh, more about the interaction relation, uh, relation between the state um, um, and the potential outcome from the public. So the governmentality logic underlies, uh, underlying uh, the issue of whom to govern and how to govern is shown uh, in the uh, design of the governmental programs. Um, it's also in the way that social problems are defined and the divisions or uh, distinctions are established um, and uh, even in the um, uh, different, uh, different kind of knowledge produced uh, by the uh, state or the government to, uh, to shift the people's ideologies. So social welfare uh, provision is one of the most important um, um, case that um, um, uh, in the uh, political and society change, it can be directly perceived by the, uh, by the uh, individuals. So uh, my empirical work in this book uh, many focus on the case of major pension uh, uh, policy changes in China uh, after the uh, 1978 um, um, reform and opening up. Um, this area is one that can review uh, the state's purposeful design in modifying the distribution of public goods um, and balancing the role of uh, the government and the public in welfare provision. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, social policy uh, relating to the old age benefits um, it's also uh, an area where many negotiations are possible. So people are less likely to give up their own benefits. Um, therefore, the government will need more efforts in, pro uh, in, in promoting and persuading people about the reforms they want to achieve. 
So my investigation on, on the social welfare is uh, therefore guided by this threat to inqu uh, inquiry uh, and the paradigm I discussed before. Um, and this is uh, um, slightly different from uh, uh, many other works on similar topics, um, um, uh, which, uh, which either sim uh, simply focus on the, um, uh, uh, the uh, descriptive details of changes in policies or uh, prioritizing the institutional settings of the policies or take a more uh, simplistic uh, way of treating the welfare policy as purely um, uh, a tool of surveillance and repression. So in the book, I argue that um, the um, uh, strategy used by the state um, uh, to respond to the potential uh, legitimacy crisis and to generate public compliance is uh, uh, hybrid, organic, and dynamic. Um, China's authoritarian governance um, uh, has been an active process uh, of rule by design, which is uh, um, constantly adapting to new social and economic situations. On the one hand, the state um, uh, captures the public expectations and adjusts its own strategies to meet them. Um, on the other, uh, the state intentionally shapes the uh, uh, public expectations and manufactures compliance to keep the reform going. Um, however, the state's well designed statecraft. Um, will need to enable individuals to make sense of their own experiences um, and they must uh, um, uh, resonate it with their common senses um, because individuals can update their, uh, their knowledge from their personal interest, from uh, the information inside the policies, and also from their peers in the society. So they can decide whether they want to stay loyal or choose to, uh, to uh, uh, choose the non-compliance uh, strategy. Um, and even in a situation where uh, uh, some active um, um, rebellion, um, or this called uh, counter conduct, um, is not that possible, um, individuals may choose um, cognitional rebellion and falsify um, their public compliance. So in the book, I may use the, uh, a combination of uh, various methods, uh, including the institutional analysis um, and uh, um, a quantitative text analysis to unpack the uh, uh, public knowledge being produced during the reforms. Um, and uh, uh, I also use the uh, um, uh, causal identification to estimate the effect of key uh, policy instrument on public opinion um, and, and to see whether people change their perceptions of deservingness, uh, of the uh, locus of responsibility, and even political support. Um, in addition to this, um, actually, a heavy part of the book um, in, in chapter five um, actually moves a little bit beyond the pension policy per se, uh, but puts the uh, um, a more focus on the public um, actively. So I, I collected the qualitative evidence um, trying to discuss the issue of why uh, uh, falsified uh, compliance might exist in China and uh, um, and the mechanism, sorry, mechanisms may uh, lie behind it. So. Here, I wanted to give you a little bit more details of the book um, uh, with one example, the deservedness uh, chapter. So this uh, chapter actually uh, discusses the issue of uh, who deserves uh, benefits and why. So we, we commonly would think that it is people's social rights to receive public welfare, uh, yet in practice, the policy design of pension is conventionally uh, very fragmented and scattered. So people may have different types of schemes, right? Uh, according to their occupations, their age groups. Um, so um, the different models of pension, actually um, uh, the, the policy design uh, adopted by the uh, government actually signals the uh, very rationales of the, uh, their governmentality. So uh, there were uh, two uh, prominent uh, pension models after World War II. One is the uh, World Bank model, um, and the other one is the international um, uh, labor organization model. The World Bank model, um, uh, especially the, the famed uh, multi-pillar design, is more leaning to the uh, um, uh, rationale of facilitating um, economic development and efficiency, while the IO model, uh, which uh, promotes a universal basic uh, pension plan, um, is more leaning to a social justice uh, in its design. In the 1980s and the 1990s, we have seen a widespread of uh, adoption of the World Bank model in many of our socialist or transitional uh, regimes. And the trade-off between the opportunities and the cost uh, brought by this kind of model 
um, is that it provides opportunity for the government to uh, manage the budget and increase the uh, efficiency uh, through privatization uh, and so on. But at the same time, it also raises uh, uh, some issues of uh, legitimacy challenges due to the fact that um, during the process, many sectors may disappear and uh, uh, also uh, the allocation of social benefits will face a major reshuffle. Um, so the pension reform in China during that period, uh, we have seen some cutbacks in public spending and uh, 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 many other fiscal rearrangements um, of the existing welfare programs. And uh, most importantly, there is a reconsideration of social rights um, uh, for citizenship. So uh, in uh, investigating the governmentality of the pension reforms in this chapter and also in chapter two, I dig into two uh, specific questions. One is uh, how is access to welfare resource, uh, resources distributed among different social groups um, and how does the distribution change along different time period? Um, so this question was designed to lay out the general picture uh, of policy design and benefit allocation. Um, and, and one follow up question would be, how does the state frame and legitimize its um, uh, policy uh, changes? Um, essentially, it's about what kind of truth and knowledge about pension benefits was produced during the process and being promoted by the government um, in case to uh, promote the new, um, uh, new reforms. So first of all, we can have a quick look uh, into the differentiation uh, of uh, the pension benefit entitlement. In 2015, um, there were five parallel pension schemes in China for uh, different subpopulations uh, with very different uh, nature uh, and funding resources. For government employees, um, they enjoy the government-funded fund, uh, pension, uh, pension scheme. And for public institutional uh, um, uh, employees, they used to enjoy, enjoy the same uh, government-funded uh, pension, but it was reformed in 2008 into social insurance, which means the pension uh, pro, uh, contribution uh, responsibility being shared by the government and individuals um, uh, together. And for uh, enterprise employees, um, their pension plan was uh, um, uh, enterprise funded pension. But considering the fact that in uh, before uh, the 1980s, the, uh, in China, they were mo mostly uh, um, state owned enterprises. So essentially, they are um, um, a de facto government's ultimate accountability. So um, um, in 1980s and the 1990s, their pension scheme were reformed into social insurances where the uh, funding source, the contribution uh, responsibility being shared by the government enterprise and the individuals. And for uh, finally, for urban non-salaried uh, uh, residents and rural residents, um, their uh, accessible uh, pension plan um, uh, is also social insurance with shared responsibility. So if we look at the uh, longitudinal changes of this uh, uh, pension reforms, um, it's very easy to identify a desynchronized story. So as we just mentioned, the government employees and the uh, public institution employees uh, will experience a few or uh, non reforms in their pension plans. But um, the, uh, if we look at the pension reforms for enterprise employees, um, uh, they experienced several waves of uh, reforms in the uh, 1980s and the 1990s um, uh, and into the uh, early 2000s. Um, the reforms corresponding to the economic reforms um, at the same period. Um, and if we shift our attention to the bottom right, the, um, uh, the pension scheme for rural residents and urban non-salaried uh, uh, residents wasn't available uh, even until the, uh, um, the 2009. So um, in, in chapter two, I specifically um, compared the different schemes um, uh, using uh, statistical data um, uh, on uh, some variations such as the uh, participation population, uh, the generosity, uh, um, and uh, many other uh, variables to, uh, to talk about the, um, uh, identify the population-based governance. And uh, um, the basic logic looks like the government would sacrifice um, uh, the social benefits for employees of the state-owned enterprises, um, and then uh, the uh, employees uh, of public institutions to re uh, reduce the fiscal burden, um, we're providing some modest or very slender benefits to, uh, to social groups that could be bought off very easily uh, with the minimal expense. And uh, um, during the process, the government officials um, um, are the core elites of the government power, and they constantly enjoy the most generous social benefits. 
So now we roughly know who gets what and when, but why? So uh, where is the social legitimacy of such kind of graph of redistribution, right? So commonly agreed among social scientists is that the concept of deservingness uh, refers to uh, certain criteria for judging uh, people, uh, for example, uh, concerning your welfare access um, and, uh, and the respective social values uh, of resource distribution. So based on the uh, theoretical understanding, I specifically look into um, uh, the uh, following aspects of, uh, of pension benefits in uh, official discourse. Um, the key agendas and the timings, uh, also the fairness, equality, and the responsibility allocations. So uh, to give you a better idea of how uh, this kind of social legitimacy and knowledge matters, um, for instance, in the case of uh, the pension reform for enterprise employees in the uh, late 90s uh, uh, and early 2000s, uh, it was a pay as you go system being turned into a mixed two tier system comprising social and individual in, uh, accounts. Um, during the process, the state need to persuade the enterprise employees why um, they need to take care of themselves and what should they expect from the state. Um, and for the case of pension reform for rural residents in early 1990s and the late 2000s, um, it was conducted along with the one child policy as well as the process of the rapid organization, respectively. Um, during the process, the state need to persuade the public why rural residents deserve the uh, um, uh, expanded pension benefits. So um, to unpack the uh, question of knowledge construction, um, I use the combination of machine learning and discourse analysis um, and the data source was uh, from the people's daily. Um, the analytical data is over 3,000 uh, articles containing the keywords of uh, uh, old age insurance and pension in the context uh, from 1978 to 2008. And the specific approaches are threefold. One is unsupervised structured public model um, and uh, the supervised uh, machine learning model and then the discourse analysis with the example uh, documents. Um, so the finger here um, is actually the uh, um, identify the topics from uh, this unsupervised structured public model. Um, it shows the general issues being discussed in the uh, whole document. And uh, we can see that most of them are relatively easy to understand, like the uh, pension fee, uh, old age care, um, and many others. Also, this can, uh, these different issues are connected to each other. Um, and uh, we can identify several interesting clusters. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the uh, upper uh, cluster here shows a, um, a connected uh, topics on uh, retired and pension fee, laid off workers, enterprise uh, employee pension plans. We also uh, can identify uh, here is the topic on birth uh, uh, control connected to rural officials, community care, and family care. So with this um, uh, identify the topics, we can actually um, uh, look into the timing of, of, uh, of this uh, agenda with respect to um, the different um, social and economic reforms at the time. Uh, for instance, um, the finger here uh, shows the proportional change of the topics uh, with respect to the economic uh, reform indicated in the uh, green dash line um, and also um, the pension reforms for uh, enterprise employees indicated here uh, um, uh, in the uh, blue dash line. So the topics of SOE reform and the macro economy, which are shown in the upper two uh, uh, fingers, um, do present a fluctuation uh, with respect to the economic reform, where the uh, topics on enterprise employee pension reform by year and the lead off uh, um, uh, workers by year uh, shows the fluctuations um, following the uh, uh, pension reforms for enterprise employees. So with this general idea of the topics of pension uh, changes, um, uh, along with the different uh, social economic uh, events, we can actually dig into the text and see how, uh, how does the connections being built up uh, in, the, in the text itself. Um, so this one actually is an example on uh, enterprise employees. Uh, uh, this topic, it uh, uh, presents how, uh, how it has been connected to the SOE reform. Um, it says the pension insurance for enterprise employees it's very important for uh, reducing the burden uh, for the uh, uh, burden on the state and on enterprise um, and uh, advancing the uh, reform of the economic reform, uh, sorry, economic system and guide, uh, guiding domestic consumption in a rational way. Um, another example shows you 
uh, the topic of rural pension plan. Um, and uh, uh, here shows the connections between the rural pension plan and the birth control. Um, essentially, it's the text that described that the uh, chair of the birth, uh, birth control association visited the uh, villagers and the reasoning with them about the cost and benefit of uh, um, having a second child and the cost and benefit of registering in the, into the pension insurance program. And the end point uh, suggests that uh, suggest a fair uh, exchange of registering uh, the uh, um, into the pension scheme for fewer children in rural area. So both of this um, shows that a, the pension reform could be used as instrument for uh, for the general social economic reform at the time. And uh, uh, in the book, you will find more uh, detailed analysis on uh, redistribution, uh, 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 the politics of redistribution, and also the issue of state and individual relationships um, using a supervised machine learning model. Um, and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy that um, and leave this to, to you. Um, and uh, um, to, to give a very quick wrap up on the, uh, this uh, um, uh, topic of uh, deservedness is that it shows as the logic of the statecraft of um, China's pension plan is a uh, uh, multi-dimensional. We can see the differentiated uh, um, benefit entitlement and the different rate reform paces. We can also see the customized discourse used for different social groups. Um, um, and most importantly, that is a uh, um, reconstruction of uh, individual subjectivity, which emphasize um, the individuals should be involving in the production process as self-motivated, self-regulated, and self-care. So China's case, uh, of course, is unique in many ways. But as uh, um, uh, Patrick also mentioned before, it has the potential to address the situations in other contexts and different fields. So um, especially for the frames and discourse in the welfare reforms and policy innovations, um, we always need some careful design and active agenda setting. And the tools uh, and discourse identified in China's case uh, will ultimately uh, help us to, to, uh, to explain the society knowledge, um, how it's emerged and what, uh, why it's changed, right? Um, uh, of welfare perception from a broader perspective. And also, I hope the um, uh, substantive evidence in my work using China's case can uh, give some more nuanced approach uh, in understanding the uh, state governmentality and, and its design. Um, and in the book, I also have um, uh, uh, chapters talking about whether the efforts uh, brought by the government um, using uh, propaganda and using the policy experiments um, really change the public opinion and uh, uh, why people change or not change in their perception of uh, welfare responsibility, and also a, uh, a large uh, uh, load of discussion on the uh, um, how people uh, perceive the legitimacy of the government in their daily life, and also the mundane forms of um, combinational rebellion. Uh, how is that possible in uh, in the society? Um, and I hope you you will enjoy the uh, reading the book. Um, and uh, um, that's that's our for now uh, today. And I look forward for any comments and feedback from you. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, Jan. That was a very masterful account. It's, it's enormously difficult to uh, capture the richness and the density of the many different findings and uh, uh, aspects of uh, how Chinese multidimensional statecraft works that, that are in the book. And I do urge everybody to download their copy of the book and, and study it carefully. But now let's move on to um, uh, our discussants. And uh, I'll start with uh, Carrie Freezer. Uh, uh, would you like to go first and uh, give us your views? Yeah, I mean, it would be nice for them to go first. And I'll go okay, start. all right. No, you go first. <laughs> that one, more, one more piece of instruction from you. Should I sit here or should I go to the lecture? It's entirely up to you. Okay, I'll stay here. You can hear you just as well. 
No, thanks so much uh, for inviting me to, to participate. I mean, it's it's obviously a huge source of joy to see a student produce a book, um, and especially such a great book. So congratulations, Jan. It's, it's a really important piece of work. Um, I think it's important across the social sciences. I'll, I'll offer, you know, my economist take um, and, and see what people think, see what you guys think. Um, but, but what seems, you know, to me, and, and let me say, the, the economist take is, is necessarily a bit, a bit general. Uh, so I want to zoom out from the specific case of, of China and pension policy to think a little bit about, you know, what, what do we learn about the way politics works? Um, and one, you know, the, maybe the first thing I learned from, from talking to Yan and, and then reading the book um, is that we need to think about the full distribution of, of citizen attitudes, um, not just in, in democracies, but, but also in autocracies. So sometimes we think, you know, in a democracy, the regime has to be responsive to voters. Um, the ruling party wants to perform well to get reelected. And then we might think about autocracies as caring only about performing well enough to avoid insurrection. Um, and I think Yen's work suggests that, that actually being a successful autocracy like China um, requires engaging with the full distribution and, and you know, trying to, to generate sort of what, what the regime would think of as, as you know, sort of better outcomes across the distribution. And that might mean at one end of the distribution actually generating active support that can be very useful. Um, at the other end of the distribution, of course, an, an autocracy cares about social unrest and, um, and, and concerns about, about you know, political instability and, and potential upheaval. But um, I, I think engaging with the full distribution is, is, is to me, at, at the heart of this work. Um, you know, then the question is, well, how does an autocracy do that? Um, and, and of course, Yan studies a particular case of pension policies, but I think we can generalize to think about different technologies of engaging with, with you know, a group of, of citizens under autocracy. And, and one is um, trying to, to provide material benefits. Um, another is to try to persuade uh, citizens to support you, or maybe if not support you, at least comply. Um, and, and the third, of course, is, is coercion. Um, and we can see autocracies and, and the Chinese Communist Party doing, you know, using all of these technologies, acting on different parts of the distribution in different ways at different times and in different places. Um, and I think that, that that's incredibly important when we look around the world today. Um, and, and it's not obvious how an autocracy and the Chinese autocracy in particular will do that. So when you think about you know, Hong Kong's civil unrest um, over the past five to 10 years, and you know, one might have thought that the way to engage with Hong Kong citizenry would be to you know, gradually expand democratic rights, um, and that would move people you know, toward much more compliance and maybe even support for the, aut aut the autocracy's representatives in Hong Kong. Um, instead, China went in a completely different way and decided to, to crack down um, on you know, the group of individuals who were least compliant initially, least supportive initially, and to, to, to focus much more on coercion on that part of the citizenry, um, which, you know, to be fair and to be honest, as much as that upsets me, um, in another part of the citizenry, that crackdown increased the Chinese government's legitimacy and support by generating more stability and predictability. And so the Chinese government was weighing these different parts of the distribution, evaluating the different technologies at its disposal, and decided on crackdown on one segment in return for, for you know, pure compliance and certainly not support. Um, in the other part of the distribution, perhaps more support um, and, and at the very least compliance. And, and I think you know, that's very interesting. Um, you know, looking ahead, one, you know, wonders what technologies China might try to use in Taiwan uh, if uh, it were to try to induce, uh, you know, governmentality there, um, you know, if, 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 if it happens. Uh, no, no more comment on that. Uh, so, um, you know, looking across history, we also see interesting variation. Um, you know, and, and I think, it, again, it's not obvious the way history will work. So, so when I think when the Chinese Communist Party took over, um, it, it was able to, to generate actually a great deal of support and legitimacy through ideology. 
Um, so, so revolutionary parties that win revolutionary wars have an enormous amount of support and legitimacy in many places. And I think China is one of those places. And so, so the, the Chinese, you know, it was an autocracy, but an autocracy with a huge amount of support through ideology. Then it abandoned its ideology after these 1979 reforms and relied much more on performance as, as a source of legitimacy and again, support. And I think there was a great deal of, of, of support post 79 on the basis of performance. Um, now, more recently, um, performance for a variety of reasons um, has worsened. I mean, you know, and for, for reasons within the party's control and, and external. Um, and then one wonders what happens next. And you can see Xi Jinping turning again toward ideology um, as a source of legitimacy um, in the absence of performance. And we'll see how well that works. Um, I, but I think it's interesting that, that you know, old technologies you know, can, can, can be, be brought back. Um, looking ahead, I think there are two interesting you know, questions. One is, um, what will be the role of technology um, in shaping you know, technological change and shaping which you know, sort of technologies of compliance um, the Chinese government is, is able to use? Um, you know, I think the, the obvious you know, dimension of, of technological change to think about is, is artificial intelligence um, and the use of AI to try to align behavior of, of the population with the objectives of the Chinese regime. Uh, we've all read enough dystopian novels um, and sociology to know that, that there could be this sort of alignment that might reduce the need for coercion. Um, and, and so I think there, there is reason to believe that the Chinese government could sort of maintain a great deal of stability and, it, you know, somewhere between compliance and support arising from the right use of, of AI and, and AI induced incentives, along with rich data collection and monitoring um, to reduce the need for active coercion. And I think that that's something that either we applaud because there will be less coercion or we fear it because there's a different sort of you know, technology that limits our, our, our freedom in some sense. Um, but, but I think that's an interesting, you know, a, a, an interesting question for the future. Um, the last one that, that I think, you know, remains to be seen um, is, is this question of, of, you know, what does the, the, the Communist Party's legitimacy depend on in, in terms of, of performance and ideology? And I think, um, you know, for a long time, you know, there, there's been a, a rise in, in nationalism in China. And nationalism is the sort of ideology that is, is a little bit like religion and that it's unfalsifiable. So Xi Jinping can claim to be the true representative of, of the Chinese people. And that's something that, that it's hard to, to, you know, like objectively evaluate. Whereas success fighting against COVID, success in uh, bringing Taiwan back into the motherland um, are, are sort of objective evaluation criteria um, that, that in some ways are, are a bit, you know, scarier in a way. They're higher stakes, um, you know, claims or standards for legitimacy. And I think, you know, I, I, I wonder, you know, what, what other people, and Yan maybe in particular, sort of think about a shift toward more objective standards for, for establishing legitimacy and success. And, and, you know, whether that is going to be effective, was that, you know, sort of an act of desperation? Um, is that something that, that we should be afraid of looking at? Uh, but, but I think it's a fascinating book. Obviously, it opens up huge questions. Thanks. So thanks very much, Nan. Very broad ranging uh, and reflective comments. Yes. Um, Carrie, do you, do you want to say yes. something? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to uh, just repeat what Nan has already said and just say a big congratulations to you, Jan, on this incredibly impressive book. Um, to be able to celebrate Jan's success as a PhD student and now her success in publishing this academic piece of work as a book is, it's just an honor. This is a proud moment and it's really just a happy celebration. Um, and so we're very proud of you and you should be very proud of yourself. Um, so I should start by saying that I came uh, to Yang's project without expertise in, in China um, or, or in pensions, but rather through our shared interest in governmentality as a concept. Um, and as a medical sociologist, I, I, I have long cared about pensions because I've long cared about, about old age and later life. 
Um, and, and so these shared interests is, is what has brought us together. And this is where I'm, I'm coming from. Um, and I think what's, it, it's, it's really important to probably emphasize that the ways in which you have juxtaposed different theories of state power, um, including Weberian approaches, um, Gramsci and, and Marx, along with Foucault, it is really impressive. And these are theoretical ways of thinking about state power that are often held apart. Um, and, and so I, I, I just want to, to really emphasize the, the creative theoretical work that you're doing. And to second what, what Neil has been saying in maybe more theoretical terms, um, we often think of governmentality uh, as something that goes hand in hand with liberal democracy. Um, and, and, and that this idea of, of technologies itself, of, of, of cultivating certain kinds of subjectivities is somehow antithetical to, to autocracy. And, and what your, your research shows is, is this is a false kind of divide. Um, and I think you do a, a lot of really important work in showing how the Chinese government creates these, these new subjectivities um, and, and, and how this, there's a subjectification around being self-motivated, self-regulated, and again, self-sufficient as technologies themselves, as, as, as shifting the discursive theory on which people come to understand themselves and the kinds of people they can become. So I think that this is a really important theoretical intervention that, that you make in this book and that you do in your PhD. Um, and so, in many ways, my, my notes maybe pick up on, on this, this intervention that you're, you're making and propose possibly other ways of developing this, this conceptual work. Maybe not necessarily by you, but maybe by people in the room. Or, you know, I, th I think there's a lot of research that can now be done with this groundwork that, that, you've, that you've laid out. And I think that there's a lot of implications um, for your research in terms of how you think about that in the and particularly when we start to think about, about AI, as you say, which is shaping the, 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 shaping the, the kinds of information that people use in, in constructing a, a self. So, um, and I think in this sense, what you lay out is really the, the language side of discourse and how that's used. And I, I think what you open up is the opportunity now to to extend out those those discursive practices and, and and the different ways in which that those practices come to operate. So I was thinking in in, in reading your book. So for Foucault, um, in in developing governmentality as a concept, things like psychiatry as a as an expert set of knowledge practices, um, or the hospital. As, as, a, as a way of transferring health, illness, and death from the home um, to these new expert regimes was, um, was a crucial way in which governmentality was operationalized in the European context. Um, so that, that uh, science uh, as a site of, of knowledge production, but also um, medicine became appendages of the state. And so, and, and so the, the, so the, the government, the politics with the capital P didn't need to do um, so much coercive work um, in order to get people to, to, to want to, to, to do these things. And I think that your research shows how the news media, which is clear, but is an append one such appendage. Um, but the policy ex experiment is, is another appendage. And, and, and I, I think that's what I found really fascinating about the, the ways in which the policy experiment is this place for doing governmentality. And I, I was wondering, what are there other kinds of new actors involved in these policy experiments who are reshaping old age in China during this time? And I just wondered, could there be a, a kind of third dimension to that, that mapping? Um, so, so I was asking myself, you know, does a discipline like gerontology play a role in the policy experiments in China or not? Um, and if not, who does? Um, and so 
probably because I'm a medical sociologist, so I just became really interested in, in figure 3.3 3 and, 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 and the status of old age care and community care. And I, I really love how you, you show how, how community care and the one child policy um, becomes this way of convincing people to, to take this on. But I was wondering, are there any other corollary developments in the institutions that facilitate home-based elder care, for example? Like what practices need to, to come into play? And, and it's just what, in terms of what work needs to be done to make the discourse of filial piety? So this, the hearkening back to these traditional references, um, to what, what makes them work? Uh, in these in these new moments, um, what practices need to be there or don't, um, and and to what extent is there maybe a desire to reimagine filial piety that that is um, being tapped into, um, or not? Um, so, and I think as you say that the AI question is is crucial in all of this because I think artificial combine the media. Com combined with digital technologies, and we all know us better than anyone else, is, is shaping what, what information we can, can have and, and, and how, how people construct our views of themselves. So I think there's so, so much work to be done from this, this fabulously rich book. So thank you and congratulations. Stimulating remarks. Now, uh, we're in the uh, portion of the um, uh, of the event where uh, we'd really like to get some questions from the floor from people in the room, and I think there are some microphones uh, either uh, working or um, someone will circulate around. Um, and uh, meanwhile, also um, people online, uh, let's uh, get some questions in. Um, from you guys, uh, and uh, we, we'd really encourage you to uh, put your questions into the chat and uh, we'll relay. But let's go to questions in the room. Uh, as you know, in many countries, the pension funds are in crisis because they are managed as private uh, enterprises. It is because of the rising uh, life expectancy that makes the, uh, the, the um, difference be between the fraction of those who receive pensions and, and those who produce wealth is this gap is increasing. Uh, my question is uh, how China has coped with this problem. Thanks. Are we tracking more questions or are we answering one by one? Right, okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, of course, it's a uh, uh, basic common issue for the pension uh, to get in trouble. Um, and also, according to the uh, uh, development of the demographic features of society, um, there will be a uh, extend, extended uh, demand from the uh, pension system. I think in China's case, um, as I mentioned, uh, there have been reforms um, in uh, in the early uh, 2000 and in uh, 20, 20, 2010s. In the different period, actually see different designs of the pension reforms. Um, as I said, uh, for different social groups, they will, there will be different uh, schemes for them. Um, and uh, um, also, um, um, in addition to the uh, pillared uh, um, pension scheme, um, we also saw uh, there is a state-funded basic pension uh, to, to get this kind of basic uh, social net, uh, sort of safety net for, uh, for everyone in the society. So that's one way uh, the government is doing, especially in entering the 2010s, uh, there is, uh, we can see an expansion of this kind of um, safety net for everyone uh, to be included in the uh, basic uh, pension support from the government. Um, even though it's like a minimal uh, uh, support, it can also be a combination of this kind of social justice and the uh, efficiency combined together uh, in the policy design. So I think China, um, uh, China's case is, uh, is 
may not be replicable for, for all other countries, but at least it can give some um, basic ideas of how uh, basic pension plan uh, and the uh, pillared uh, uh, pension schemes can be combined uh, for, for varied social groups. Good. A any other questions? Yes. Uh, Oh. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Dr. Wang, thank you very much for your book and your your uh, shares about China's pension policy, and also you you like share the the, the world how China managed the pension policies through decades. So, my my question is, I I would like to know your own opinion. Uh, do you think there will be a bureaucratic drift in the pension policy? In China, because we know we have a new leadership panel to, uh, this year, and and we knew what happened in Shanghai. This strict COVID uh, uh, COVID policy. So, uh, and you also mentioned you you use a lot of political science theories, and you used quantitative methods to analyze those situations. But I, I, I I'm keen to know from your perspective what will be the future like. Uh, like, is it a, will you consider it a principal agent problem when the Chinese government to, to make the pension policy? Because you also mentioned about public goods, which means if they, the, the government officials, they make the pension policy, they will, like, uh, they, they probably will uh, to make the policy be favorable for the uh, public servant. Yes, thank you. Right, that's a very interesting question. Um, actually, it's also re uh, related to Carrie's question of uh, is there new actors in this uh, policy experiment uh, in, in China's case? Actually, um, it is important to think about the principal agents question um, um, in, 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 uh, in governing or, or governance issues in general. And uh, um, in my thought, uh, the, the, the model I showed you before, it was a uh, two actor model, right? The state and the public or uh, individuals, the interaction between them. There is this kind of um, actor uh, in between, which is the viewers. Um, they, can, uh, they can have more information of their own performances and also their own um, willingness of uh, adapting new ideas of policy reforms. And uh, the pension uh, system, uh, as I mentioned, there, are, there is a great uh, deal of negotiations happened. And one of the negotiation type is actually the policy experiment which um, 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 have a great uh, um, uh, salient of the local bureaucrats, uh, whether they wanted to be a pilot region in the uh, experiment um, in, initiated by the central government, or they can also initiate the uh, experiment by themselves. So um, the local governments, their willingness, uh, and also their ideas on uh, redistribution, also their education or uh, gender or their age, uh, will be factors of backing uh, whether this region uh, received more uh, on the pension reforms or reform the schemes or not. So that's why actual actor um, uh, really um, causes this kind of variations across different regions. Um, and uh, it's, it's not um, entirely covered in this book's discussion, but it's surely an important question to answer in the future if we wanted to think about the uh, variations across different regions and also the rules local bureaucrats played in, in the process. And uh, um, uh, in the future, um, I, I, I don't know uh, what the future will be like because um, the, the, um, the agency of the local bureaucrats um, definitely will shape the uh, grown, grown uh, landscape of uh, governance in China. And uh, um, even though the central government has much control over the personnel, over the uh, promotions, um, we still can see the, uh, the activity um, promoted or initiated by the local, uh, local, gov uh, local government or local officials. So um, I would encourage people to think more about that. Um, and uh, um, um, one, uh, one thing related is the technocrats, uh, we, we always think uh, during the process, because in the new uh, uh, government uh, formed during the uh, 20th uh, party congress, we can see more uh, technocrats were included in the, uh, in the uh, top leadership. So, um, uh, well, uh, of course, following uh, she's leadership. Um, but uh, it's uh, whether that's going to change 
uh, China's governance um, and also the scenario of uh, especially public goods redistribution is something uh, we, we can think about uh, in the future's uh, research. Okay. I guess I have one comment and one quick question. And firstly, congratulations. And as a social policy researcher, really thank you for contributing this really great work um, to uh, welfare politics in China. I think currently the influential work on welfare politics in China concentrate uh, in the area of understanding the political will of the very top leaders or well, let's say principal agent, you know, view, but it's it's sort of limited to the state sector, like the bureaucratic politics, whereas not least because uh, the area of space between state and uh, society is very difficult to research. Uh, however, your, your work really geniusly use machine learning plus um, discourse analysis to really capture um, public opinion and you know the dynamics there. So my question is, where will this success lead to the next success? We really were very interested in you know what this work has inspired you to, to work on next. And where your next <coughs> monography might come from, <laughs> if you, are, you don't mind to share. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, um, it, uh, a quick answer for, for your question is that um, uh, surely I haven't had a um, very firm idea on what my uh, next uh, question is going to be, but it will be related to the um, public opinion um, and also the state society relationship, um, especially on the issue of social cleavage. Um, we have seen, uh, especially after the COVID-19, we have seen the divisions in the society regarding many issues, um, on, for example, the COVID policy and also on the uh, nationalism ideologies, right? There is a huge division among the society itself. And how do we understand the landscape of that, the landscape of that uh, division, as well as the role brought by the state itself, um, is something I wanted to explore in the future. Um, and uh, if I got extra uh, um, time and uh, energy, I probably will dig into more on the uh, bureaucracy agency as well. Um, but that's something uh, uh, in the design, not settled yet. Um, thanks for that. <laughs> Another question from. Congratulations on the book. Uh, my question is that uh, when designing pension policy, the government inevitably looks for to other countries for experience, mm -hmm. and uh, in, and uh, when they well, manufacture the knowledge to justify the reforms or whatever, they sometimes would run into this constraint. I expose the uh, virtues of the GPS system to persuade. The citizenry, but you can see that how that, that can somehow undermine the uh, you know, justification for the socialist aspect of the society. I am wondering, you know, in making part of a policy, how does government make the trade off in those two constraints? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, I surely uh, it's a trade off between the opportunities brought by the, uh, the experiences by the other countries and also the cost of uh, persuading the, um, the society. Um, I think there are, if we think about this data as a, a actor uh, who is actively uh, adapting to the new social and uh, economic uh, situations, um, the strategies they use can be a multi-dimensional. Um, it's not just a one source of uh, argument to borrow. Um, and also, as, uh, as we all know, the state itself is not one entity, right? Um, when we look into uh, the details of the persuasions or uh, the interaction with the society, you can see many different strains of uh, arguments. They can borrow from the traditional ideology uh, and uh, like the traditional culture, or they can borrow from the, uh, the four ex uh, experiences um, which is uh, called advanced experiences from the, the other countries, or they can uh, borrow from the uh, socialist period uh, about the, uh, the, the fairness of redistribution. Um, and I think it, it's really uh, um, uh, interesting to see the, the, uh, the nuance uh, inside this kind of uh, interaction. 
uh, rather than to, to just sim uh, well, simplify the argument as one strategy. And I, I, I would, would um, think it as a more uh, dynamic one, especially considering a few uh, see the flow of time um, in different uh, 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 what geopolitical scenarios, um, you will see different strategies, whether they would uh, borrow more from uh, the national, uh, nationalism ideology or from uh, a um, advanced uh, international um, idea is, is actually depends on the, uh, the, the, the temporary uh, scenario they are facing. So yeah, I think that's, that's something I I've learned from, uh, from the materials I, I uh, did in the past. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, I've just started my economic journey, so forgive me if my questions are nuanced. I'm new to this whole thing, probably at least with the group. But my question is um, with this whole, you know, COVID 19 pandemic, with all these recent events, Russia, Ukraine, um, the governments have seen that they obviously have had to ex exercise a whole new degree of power and they've uh, in a way that's never been seen before. Do you think this will? Um, do you think? Do you think the potential of the government to change their perspectives to their pension policy and um, their treatment towards these certain uh, these populations that you're talking about? Do you think that's likely to change in the near future, or do you think it's going to remain relatively stable with the whole AI thing that? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. I think it's also related to Norma and Karen's comment on the AI and technologies um, being used uh, in, in the current situation, as well as the potentials uh, brought by the COVID-19 system, sorry, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, um, I'm not entirely sure about whether that's going to be more stable or uh, going to be uh, um, new changes, but surely the technology will bring new possibilities for the government to manage uh, for example, the the information will be easier to 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 manage for the government uh, from the individual level, um, and then uh, the pension system, um, especially regarding the redistribution, um, it might be uh, uh, possible that um, the for some sectors um, they will they will see a, a reshuffle of social rights, um, and for some uh, social groups they will see a, a increase of their uh, benefits. Um, it's really um, something interesting to investigate in the future, I think. I'm acutely conscious that uh, everybody in the room who's there can can uh, very soon adjourn to get some drink. So perhaps we could have one more question. Uh, and if there isn't that one question, perhaps we could uh, move to close the session and you could all migrate to the drinks. And I will migrate to my lonely glass of Prosecco or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, any last question that anybody would like to ask? I have a really quick one. Yeah. What, what is bureaucrats, bureaucrats agency? Right. So yeah, that's actually um, something related to um, the um, it can it can be uh, unpacked uh, in several ways. One is uh, their abilities um, and then their willingness. Um, and uh, uh, finally, um, what they are doing. So basically, it's whether the uh, bureaucrats have the uh, preferences or incentives to increase or decrease the redistribution of public goods uh, in, in the case of pension reforms, um, and also whether they prefer uh, the social justice or the efficiency of the uh, econ economic development. So it's essentially uh, about the local bureaucrats um, involvement in the political decision making um, or the policy uh, making process, um, uh, and uh, they would bring their own ideas right um, in the in the process. So that's how their agencies could be understood. Good, thank you so much. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. It, it remains to me really to to wrap things up and to say. 
First of all, many thanks to Noam and Carrie for your uh, very interesting and wide ranging comments. And particular congratulations again to Jan on a, a, a very brilliant uh, piece of work and a very uh, interesting presentation, uh, which will soon be available from LSE recording and so forth. And I'm sure we'll have a, a big effect in publicizing the book. In the meantime, if you haven't uh, got your copy of the book, uh, do make sure that you download it and uh, let's get, uh, get the momentum started for it. I'm sure it's going to be a huge success. So it remains to me to thank everybody for coming, thank everybody online. We've been very grateful for the uh, uh, participants who were like me coming in over Zoom and thank everybody in the room. Thank you for your very interesting questions and uh, please do now adjourn in the room and get yourself some refreshment. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>